Uh, welcome to everybody, and uh, it's great to be here and uh, listening to Paul Hellyer the way I did just uh, before lunch. Uh, I think in preparation for what we're going to see uh, in a few minutes, you, you are well prepared if you attended Mr. Hellyer's lecture um, to hear what I'll be relaying to you. So in preparation for that, uh, I do not apologize one moment for this being a very, very political statement about what we're involved in. It's highly political. Uh, you'll hear a lot of different views uh, in, in the many different rooms that you're going to be going to later on today and even tomorrow. Um, but they're all pointing towards one different thing, okay, the one same thing. And that is there's something going on with our reality. Something is going on with people manipulating our reality for us. And that's what I'm going to talk about today the kind of manipulation that our government is involved in and our media are involved in to make reality their reality and not a reality that um, I think we all need to understand in a greater picture. So uh, with that, I'm going to launch into it. After the first little while, I'll go through things rather quickly because um, I've got a lot of information to cover and a lot of government documents, a lot of other things that have to do with the media regarding uh, the kinds of stuff we're talking about. That's the talk. How well are we, are we being lied to? And it's a very, um, very poignant statement because we are being lied to very, very effectively by those two entities on the top line. What we're going to do is examine the relationship between government and media and see how secrecy has been established and maintained. Two very important ideas. It's been established and it's been maintained and orchestrated in a very careful way. A bit about Z-Line Communications. It's a new service that takes us to the edge and beyond. That's what I run. Uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, we move uh, all of the information towards the public in a way that provides news. It's the only Canadian news service, you can read that for yourself, that uh, dedicates itself to the actual disclosure and analysis of information about the geopolitical implications of disclosure and the uh, uh, extraterrestrial presence that's now engaging us. And we do that on a day-to-day -day basis, and the amount of information that comes out through ZNN, through Z9 Communications, is massive. Uh, it's hard to keep track of. But the number of sources that we go to makes it pretty easy to get the really good salient information. What you'll hear today is a two-part thesis. The first part of the thesis is based on what I call um, a proven existence of a massive compendium of documents and witness testimony proven beyond any doubt that this phenomenon, the UFO phenomenon, has been discussed, analyzed, assessed, and sequestered at the highest levels of governance and military authority on the planet. That's the first part of the thesis. That is a fact, okay? And once again, um, I, I would like to say that I'm not trying to convince anybody about this. You're gonna have to sort of look at the information and judge for yourself how well you're being lied to based on the information that, um, that I'm giving you today. The second part is that. We are, in fact, being lied to about this whole issue and about a lot of other issues also, but about this issue primarily because it's probably one of the most historically important information for, uh, for the human race. Like I said, you'll hear different perspectives today, some complementary, some divergent, some challenging. But the goal is necessarily to provide the widest possible context on what this ET disclosure thing is all about. What's it all about? Why are we struggling to find out what's going on? The result is essentially you're witnessing a new phenomenon. And that is a global emergence of an authentic process of geopolitical and consciousness shift with respect to the UFO ET disclosure issue. Things are moving in a direction that, we, quite frankly, we won't be able to stop it once, it once it begins to move the way we think it will be. So, we can move, but we don't do things one day at a time. We can't do a whole lot of things all at once. But the one thing that we can do, we can't change the world in a day. And here's where things kind of get kind of political. But I'm convinced that we, we can certainly get the smell of stupid out of the furniture. <laughs> and that's where we start, okay? And so where do we start? We start in places like that. Okay? The furniture and the people in those buildings. I don't know if you can tell the difference between the furniture and the people in those buildings, but uh, that's where we start. And that's one of the things that Zealand Communications does. We work not with the government, but at the government, to have them analyze what they're saying or not saying about it. And what we have to do is reorient the political mindset away from secrecy and denial towards a complete openness and truth. 
not the truth, but truth, whatever that might be. Um, we're neither stupid nor blind to the facts. I think you all realize that. All this information is self-evident, even to the most naive person. I talk to kids in grade four and grade five in school presentations about this. They know all about it. They know exactly what's going on. It's nothing new to them. And these are, you know, eight, nine, 10, 12, 13 year old kids. They know exactly what's going on. So we are challenged with the task of bringing this information forward. That's one of the things that Zealand Communications does, is we bring all the information forward as much as we can. We sift through it very carefully. We try to provide the most salient information possible. If we don't do it, no one else is gonna do it. And the other thing too is, we have a right to know what's going on. It's a very key factor with, about all of this. I don't wanna get into the idea of the donative rights of people, the God-given right for us to know. There are no secrets, or there should be no secrets. I'm of the opinion that we have constitutionally given our governments the right to keep secrets, but we've never given our government the right to lie to us. That's what's very important to understand. That's the key issue here. They will say, well, national security. Well, what if national security is a lie? They do not have the right to, keep a, to, to do that to us. What we're dealing with here, what are we dealing with? First of all, it's the highest level of strange as possible, the most bizarre and most strange. When you take a look at some of the things that are going on, even in the other rooms, it is bizarre, it is strange, it's otherworldly. So how do you make sense of it? Just want to show you something here. Um, I'm hoping that I can start this thing properly. If I just point it at that, will you do it or? Go, you have to go back one. Yeah, this one here. Here's just a, a sample of what, of what we kind of see. I'll let you make your mind up as to what it might be. It was seen by well over 200 people in Mexico in the early 90s. How do you make sense of that? This is only one of the millions and millions of videos that are out there. And by the way, I don't put anything up they haven't had vetted carefully, okay? The next one is even as bizarre. You'll see, a, a, this is a Apollo landing takeoff. You'll see a white dot flow across the screen from your left to my right. Play that, it does it twice. This is just at the landing, or the takeoff rather. And here it goes again in slow motion. It's not debris, it's something that should not be there, but is. Let me start that one for me. This is in Fukushima, just after the nuclear event in 2011. I've, seen, I've watched this over 500 times. I have no idea what's going on there. There are 12 of them, six stay in a straight line, and six of them dance around and coalesce up the top at the very end. A government official will have 97 explanations for that. Well, maybe 96. Do you want to see that one again? Yeah. Let's do that one again. I've watched this over 500 times and I still can't make out, and I followed each one each time. It's intelligent control, intelligent design, something's going, it's not a random act of a firecracker going over the edge or lanterns, or anything like that. Okay, now this next one makes a bit of explanation. You're gonna see, you see the, the, the dot in the blue sky there? Just very, very lightly to the uh, left of the clouds. You'll see that, there's a central orb to it, and around the orb you'll see some flapping configurations. They're trying, they're going around the orb that way. And as the orb moves, it's, it, the flapping stops and it ejects something. It does it multiple times and then it goes into the clouds. So let's play that one, please. And it moves into a triangle shape as it enters the cloud. Let's do that one more time. And those, the white things just dance around and uh, just finish off. I don't know where they go, what happens to them. But notice, each time it ejects some sort of um, orb, it stops the flapping. 
mass sighting, by the way. Once again, intelligent control. Anyways, so why is the ET question important? Okay, why the struggle for disclosure? And ultimately, how do we best understand the UFO phenomenon? Could be because of technologies, yeah, that's all part of it. A new reality in terms of quantum physics, yeah, that's all part of it for sure. Because these craft do not stop off, at least as far as I know, at Jupiter for a fill up of SO. They don't do that. They have energy at their disposal that's free and boundless. That's one reason why it's important. Contact, space travel, yeah, eventually that's going to happen. Eventually, that could be one of the reasons why it's important. End of fossil fuels, yes, definitely. That's why it's important. Truth and governance, sure, that's important too. Other mitigating factors, things like worldwide sightings in the thousands every year. Government intent, intransigence and lies and secrecy, yeah, getting rid of that's important. The abduction phenomenon, very, very significant in this whole thing, a reason why it's important. Media complicity, yeah, getting rid of that and having them tell the truth in, in, uh, in the face of the lies the governments are telling us. And above all, our right to know. But that may be so. There's one overriding question, very, very important overriding question. I've really struggled with this. What's the most important thing about what we're trying to do here in this, in this whole conference? Okay. Never mind just, uh, you know, just the UFO issue and all the things that we're discovering about ourselves, about our spirituality, about our physicality, about us. There's an overriding question. What might be the broadest possible concept or context in which to consider the ET question? The, the, what's the biggest question that we can ask? Or at least the issue that's at hand. Here's what I think it is. It's part of that, the quantum presence. All those things that you see there, I'm not going to stop to mention every single one of those. They represent the reality that we are in right now. The things that we have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Space-based weapons, healthcare access, water shortages, ideological polarization, resource theft. There's a thousand of them there. In each category, there's probably a hundred issues. Global change. These are all symptoms of a dysfunction but they're not the necessary answer. What is the broadest, the broadest possible context? Well, here's what I think. Humanity is on the threshold of the next step of its evolution as a sentient species. That is what it's all about. We are on the precipice of finding out who we are as a species. And I, unless you can come up with a better one, I can't think of any other reason why this issue and all the issues that we're dealing with over this weekend are important. Because we're right there. I call it interspecies transition. We're becoming something else because of this. We are becoming something else. The abductees will tell us that. I know that because I've spoken to them. That's part of the agenda. What that something is, we're not quite sure. You start off like that, perhaps morphing into something like this maybe, could be possibly even something like that. What will get us there? What will allow us to change as a species? We know that our DNA is being fiddled around with somehow, and the ETs are doing it. Asking the hard questions, what could this mean as we enter into this transition as a species that engages in daily, exponentially, more and more perilous, what I call, extinction behaviors, virtually every, every single day? to a species that could experience an awakening of who we are and why this thing called reality might be structured in the way that it is. These are the questions that we're going to try to find out as we evolve and no longer have reality defined for us by increasingly authoritarian forms of governance and military intelligence and media control. This is the, the fulcrum where, the, where the, everything is balanced, okay, and why things are out of balance right now. And this group here, these groups here are the ones that are at the fulcrum of that change or of that control, I should say. How this reality has, has been defined is done by a majority. Okay? We have it defined for us. Every single day, we all wake up. One of the first things we do 
we reach for a piece of information. Be it a newspaper, be it our iPhone, be it our iPad, we reach for information every single day. We are, we are just consumed by wanting information. Okay. And where do we go? Most of the time, is to the uh, mainstream media. Most of the time, not all the time. There are some people who look the other way. Who are the controllers? Could be the Rothschilds, the Rockefellers. We talked about this lunch. That fellow there. One of the biggest liars in the world, by the way. If not the, this man is caustic. I don't want to go into it, but you'll see a very wild person if I get too far into that. Corporate America, religion. These are the controllers. But who are the culprits? Who are the real culprits in all of this? And how does this translate? First of all, that's how it translates. That's, that's the story right there. And it's been that way since the early 50s. Remember when I first got a black and white TV as a kid? I sat there and I watched... I don't know what it was, some sort of detective story. I was amazed that they could actually do this. And to watch children watch this right now and get involved in the media the way they are. And what consumes people today? Well, first of all, it's two or three of the things you see on the screen right now. But they're all emanating from these sources. These are the people who control everything. And when I say everything, I mean everything. Okay. They control what you see, what you hear, and even to a certain extent what you do, what you buy, what you put on your body, what you put in your body with all the advertising. Unless you're self-aware and really realize what you're doing or what you're not doing, these people control 98.9% of the population in the world. The other 1% or 2% have the sense to know the difference. How do we increase that percentage? To be truly mindful of what's going on, it's absolutely necessary we need to understand the tactics being used by the mainstream media to keep us from addressing the authentic issues facing the human species. Do you remember we used to go into the, um, into a, like a Simpson Sears, or I'm dating myself when I say that, or Eaton's, and you had that whole bank of, of TVs. Have you ever seen that? Remember, seen those? And there'd be like you know, 10 TVs across that way, another 10, and every one of them was on a different channel, or the same channel. And that's what I see the media doing. It is just force-feeding us with information about everything. And it's of their choosing. So how do you turn that off? And I refer to this as the glass ceiling. We have to be prepared in presentations like this and you doing the things that you do to crack through that glass ceiling. There's a glass ceiling of control that will not be pierced by the average individual today. Even newscasters can't do it. You'll never see this information on 60 Minutes or Dateline. You'll see it on regional TV, but you will not see it in any major news broadcast. What tactics do they use? Misdirection, obfuscation, creation of a, tri a crisis, create an enemy, fear, bad breath, body odor, germ inf infestation, bad toilets, ISIS. Few consumers can even tell the difference anymore. It's all rolled up into one big ball of wax, and people cannot discern what's important anymore because media has put into one all-encompassing all ball of wax. And for the most part, people just can't tell the difference anymore. I call it Occupy the Mind. And when you sit in front of students, the way I did for 35 years, you can understand, you can well understand how children are so much more absorbent about this stuff than we are. This is the reality. It's a very, very messy world out there. And that's the way we get hit by it. Every day. It's just one thing after another. It doesn't matter what it is. It's funny, when I put down, is, is, pregnant, is Kate pregnant again? I, um, I wonder, is she, is she pregnant now again? I don't know. She, is she not? Oh, she hasn't spawned yet. Oh, I see. Okay. Okay. Are we lucky that she hasn't? I'm not quite sure. But that's, that's what we're faced with every single day. I mean, let's admit it. So the media ensures a steady diet revolving carousel of information, newspaper stories, front page stories. One school massacre one day is used to wrap fish the next day. And that's the way we treat news. Okay? And this thing with Mr. Jenner or Miss Jenner or it or whatever it is, don't understand it. Have no concept of what's really going on there. But the media is making it be okay. It might be okay. 
that's a reality. I, I, you know, I'm fully well equipped to deal with it. But in the face of everything else, it's an attempt to orchestrate and obfuscate the real issues that what we're dealing with today. So the fact that you see this person called, what's, what's it, what's he call himself now, Caitlin? He or she is on the front of Vanity Fair magazine. I saw this at uh, Shop, Shoppers Drug Mart the other day. And I stood and I looked at it and I said, I, I didn't know what to make of it. I have no idea what to make, regardless of what your opinion of transgender people is. What kind of issues is that kind of information covering up? So it's not just a cover up by the government, it's a cover up by the media. Comes at us from all directions, doesn't matter. Just spins around and you just still get so confused and you just say, oh my goodness, you know, and I just leave the room. So what do you do? What can be done? First of all, you can ignore or you can test the information or we can integrate into our understanding of the truth embargo. Ignore or contest. I choose to contest it. That's why I'm here. The truth embargo and the essence of the ET uh, issue question cannot be fully understood or appreciated unless one understands the role the media plays in propagandizing all forms of information. An authentic, thorough, consistently applied understanding of government media complicity is absolutely essential. And the one thing that we need, this is what I told the kids in school, is you need what I call as a crap detector. You have to be adamant about building in a crap detector in your own mindset. And this is what I try to do with my own children and the children that I taught. Identify shit where it is and call it the shit that it is. And once you do that, you give it a name. And once you give something a name, then you can look at it in, in, in what it's trying to do to you. If you don't give it a name, it integrates into your personality, into your mindset, and you pass it off as just ordinary information. So a crap detector, that's not my term, by the way. It's Ernest Hemingway's term. You have to have a built-in crap detector to deal with the world today. A million things on the face of the media, okay? Now, here's where we get to the meat and potatoes of things. The government control. To what depths will the government go to to hide this information? The answer is, really, they'll do anything they can. They'll do anything and everything to keep this information from us. Once again, there's the glass ceiling. They have erected a very effective glass ceiling. How does that happen? How does it work? Well, that's one kind of thing they do for us. Okay. It's the reality hiding behind whatever they want to call the reality. Their way of explaining what this UFO phenomenon is all about. Secondly, it's psychological warfare. And this is extremely important. The kind of warfare that goes on that you're not aware of. You're not, you're not aware of the fact that you are in a war. Okay. It all started with this memo, 1951. Very important memo. The early origins of the psychological warfare on Americans, done by the CIA. Its title was Flying Saucers. I mean, how many people know that the, <laughs> the CIA has documents named Flying Saucers? They've got a whole compendium of them. That's what the document, part of the document looks like. Part of it says, I suggest that we discuss an early board meeting to the possible offensive or defensive utilization of these phenomena for psychological warfare purposes. Now, why would the CIA, back in 1951, be involved in the psychological warfare? For what purpose? What did they know then that we didn't know? Why would they even mention the term psychological warfare? Then along comes 1952 and this memo, called the Edward Talos Memo, probably even more insidious. And I'll break this thing down for you. Okay, once again, it's called Flying Saucers. It's a different memo, but it's also class classified with the, the Flying Saucer uh, title. Very, very important memo, back in 1952. That's the section that's important, and I sort of cleaned it up a little bit for you. And it says, notwithstanding, so long as a series of reports remains unexplained, inter planetary aspects of the alien origins not excluded, caution requires that intelligence continue on the subject. Notice the term interplanetary aspects of alien origins. They didn't use the terms that we use today. Okay? So just the very fact that that's in a memo in the CIA says something about their tactics and how it originated. And then the second part of the memo that's important is this one. 
it is strongly urged that no indication of CIA interest or concern reach the press or public of the soundness of unpublished, fa unpublished facts in the hands of the U.S. government. In other words, we put up the glass ceiling. That's where it started. Okay, and the reason we're not getting the truth is because the CIA and the FBI and the NRO and the NSA have all been hard at work putting that into practice and implementing it on a day-to-day -day basis and they're getting more and more and more sophisticated as the years go by, as the decades go by. Another one, the draft of the Durant Report, six major initiatives, very go through this quickly, psychological warfare, education and debunking programs, the panel's concept of a broad educational program integrating efforts of all concerned agencies was that it should have two major aims, training and debunking. The debunking aim would result in the reduction in public interest in flying saucers. The education could be accomplished by mass media such as television, motion pictures, and popular articles. What more proof do you need that the Durant committee decide to put that in place? And the media bought it hook, line, hook, line, and sinker back then. They bought it all, completely. Then they began the educational program, okay, and they would hope, they hoped to have, the dangers related to flying saucers should have been greatly eliminated, if not completely reduced. Amateur astronomers were used, okay, to spread the gospel. And mass communication techniques, perhaps advertising experts would be helpful. Anybody remember in the room here, remember Arthur Godfrey? <laughs> okay, so we're showing our age here. But he was a tool. He was a tool of, of, of the CIA. He was one of the major people back in the 50s and 60s who shot the line. This is all from Terry Hansen's book, Missing Times, by the way. Negating the, the idea that there were extraterrestrials out there. Another report from the CIA. The highlighted paragraph there, the PAO, the Public Affairs Office, has relationships with reporters from every major wires, news service, news, television network in the nation. They had the capacity to even persuade reporters to postpone, change, or even scrap articles. Okay. This is the hand of the CIA reaching into the media and telling the media what to do. And if you think that the media is independent, well, think again. That's not the way it works. So what lengths will they go to to ensure secrecy? Here's a great example, historical example. We all know about the, uh, the first atomic bomb. 1945, July 16th, okay. they had to find a way to keep it secret. They had to be innocuous about it. They had to find a way to tell a story that everyone would buy. There's only one way to do it. They needed to manipulate the media, and they did a great job at it. They did a, an amazing job at it. The first nuclear explosion event at the Trinity site, 1945, was successfully explained to the press and the public by the Manhattan Press agent as a munitions dump explosion. They went around to all the farmers and told them that the, one of their munitions dumps exploded. Meanwhile, thousands and thousands of tons of TNT were set off in a nuclear event. And not only did they do that, lying to the people then, manipulating the media then, but this fellow here, he was in charge of the whole kit and caboodle, General Leslie Groves, and he actually went before the press and said, this talk of radioactivity is so much nonsense. Bald-faced lie. What else can I say? Steven Spielberg was threatened by NASA not to make close encounters. How many of you knew that? He was told in a 20-page letter not to make, or at least not make it in the way he wanted to. What's NASA's reasoning behind that? What did Spielberg know? Why did they not want the thousands of mil or millions of people that were going to watch that movie, why did they not want his message to get out? Essentially, what he did was 
he found out that if, if he made this movie because of he, he had made Jaws, that you know people would feel there's sharks in your bathtub or the toilets. Okay, if Jaws had the effect on the on the public as it did back then, would this Close Encounters of the Third Kind be as effective with the public as Jaws was? And they were deathly afraid of that. So they had him change things. They had him alter the script and change the concept of the movie to soften it down a little bit. And this is from the actual director, okay? A director saying this in an interview by Dave McGowan. William Bader testifying before the Senate Intelligence Committee. You don't need to manipulate Time Magazine, for example, because there are central intelligence agency people at the management level. This is all from Carl Bernstein, by the way. There's Carl, you know, most of you know who Carl Bernstein is or was, the, of Watergate, along with Bob Woodward. More than 400 American journalists in the past 25 years have secretly carried out assignments for the CIA according to the documents on file at CIA headquarters. So you can see how incisive and intrusive the CIA really is in controlling the media. The history of the CIA is involved with the press and shrouded official policy of obfuscation, deception. The use of journalists has been among the most productive means of intelligence gathering employed by the CIA. So really, it puts you in a position of really not knowing what to believe when you read the newspaper or when you read any kind of article. It doesn't matter what the subject is. Who's telling you about it? Why are they telling you? And what is it trying to relay to you in the form of a message that's deflecting you from what the real issues are? Other organizations that cooperate, CBS, NBC, United Press International. Here's a great example, a fantastic example of exactly what I'm talking about. It's the Washington Post and the owner, Philip Graham, and his wife, who later was the, uh, the publisher. And this, that's the lady who took over, their daughter. Actually, they sold this now to somebody who owns Google. Interesting. And this fellow here, Frank Weisner, their lawyer. Okay. These two instigated, were part of putting together a project in the CIA called Project Mockingbird. Now, I'm not going to get into Mockingbird because it's far too complex. But all you need to do to, to find out more about it is Google that and you'll find out a whole lot more about it. Unfortunately, both of those guys committed suicide, quote unquote. One in 63, one in 65. We don't know why Philip Graham did what he did to himself, apparently, but we know why Frank Weisner did. And he was going to blow the whistle on the whole thing. And that's why he was taken care of. Okay? And there's that Project Mockingbird again, buying influence. Okay? And it's been very successful through the years. Very, very successful. Catherine Graham would attend CIA luncheons on a regular basis. And at one of the luncheons, she said this, I, we live in a dirty and dangerous world. There are some things the general public does not need to know and shouldn't. I believe democracy flourishes when the government can take legitimate steps to keep its secrets and when the press can decide whether to print what it knows. I'm not sure if you <laughs> received a standing ovation on that or not, but you can see the mentality that's operating. This is the publisher of the Washington Post. We will keep our secrets. We will keep stuff from you. We will find out about it, and no matter how hard we try, no matter how creative our journalists are, we will find out about it. The only two really that got away with it were Woodward and Bernstein, because the CIA had reasons to make sure that Nixon did not remain in the White House. That's another story altogether. So, we've got a new species of information, very diversionary information. Once again, the only good defense is a good crap detector. So we're in a position now where the corporate media is a Jekyll and Hyde, because how else are we going to find out about information? The internet? I don't know. As far as I'm concerned, the jury is still out. But it's a free-for-all in every way, shape, and form. Okay? So the media could be, the mainstream media could be our best friend, or it could be our worst enemy. We're not really sure. 
So we have to be careful with that, understanding that if this story does break, if somehow there is a creative owner out there, someone who's willing to buck the system of a major publication, like Time or like whatever, doesn't matter what it is, if you get somebody in a position like that who's willing to buck the system and <laughs> suffer the consequences, you get a creative journalist to start talking about this UFO ET issue, there are no holds barred after that. This will unfold faster than you would ever imagine it will. But waiting for that creative publisher or that creative owner is like waiting for Godot. He just may not show up. So there's that aspect, large corporate media versus the courage of singular journalism. Who are these people now? Who are the people that are on the cusp of trying to find this information out? I deal with them on a regular basis. Okay? Where will the next Bert Woodward and Bernstein come from? There are some people out there. I don't know if you're familiar with these people. Jennifer Harper. She works for the Washington Times. She regularly follows the, um, the, uh, the activity of, of Stephen G. Bass of the Paradigm Research Group in her column, The Beltway. Writes about Steve's work on a consistent basis. And I communicate with Jennifer on a regular basis because she is attempting to dig deeper into this whole thing. And her editors, for whatever reason, are giving her the okay to go ahead with it. She talks about government secrecy. She talks about the obfuscation. She talks about why Stephen Bassett is undergoing this attack on the White House in terms of information. The other one is Lee Spiegel, who works for the Huffington Post. Anyone familiar with Lee's work? Well, if you're not, you should read his column almost on a daily basis, because he's always got something new and creative to say. He's an excellent journalist. Another fellow who lives here in Toronto, or lives in Toronto, uh, Ben Rayner, the Toronto Star. He's an entertainment writer. I've met with Ben several times, and he is very, very involved in this issue. He writes mostly about music, but he has this urge, this burning urge, to begin the process of, of disclosure. And he has the ear of his, of his, uh, of his editor. His editor is, is on side with this. His editor is on side with it. I know that for a fact. But perhaps his editor is being muzzled somehow, and he can't write exactly what he wants. He did a great article on... Um, UFOs Declassified by uh, Wayne Abbott, a Canadian producer. It's on uh, the History Channel, by the way. UFOs Declassified. It's a Canadian production, incredibly well done. Much like the uh, MUFON Hangar 2, or rather Hangar 1. And the other one is Billy Cox of the Herald Tribune. Billy writes this, about this stuff all the time. He's very uh, articulate, uh, very passionate about it. So this is the kind of journalist that we need, and they're few and far between. In some of the work, there's Jennifer's, uh, some of the stuff that she covers. The activist is, is, um, is Bassett, and she's being allowed to write this, which I think is a great move forward. Oh, let's go back here for a second. There's uh, Ben's article, UFOs Declassified, Looks Hard Evidence Behind Infamous Sightings. Now, how controlled that particular article was, I don't know. By reading it, I could say it was fairly well controlled, but the fact that we're moving ahead and getting this stuff into the Toronto Star says something about the level of disclosure that's going on. Now, you combine these possibilities um, to the work of the modern-day disclosure people, people like this fellow here, you'll be listening to him right after my talk. These are the heroes. Stephen Bassett. Have any of you watched any part of the citizen hearings from April 13th, 2013? Citizen hearings, you have to watch it. You have to watch it. You have to go and watch the 30 hours of testimony by 40 witnesses in front of a panel of former Congress people and one senator over five days. I covered the whole event from the Monday to the Friday. The waves of information coming from these pilots, researchers, former military people, FAA administrators, it was like waves lapping onto the shore. You just couldn't stop it. And these people, these, con these former congressmen and the, and, the, and the senator, they just didn't know what to say. I had lunch with Merrill Cook, a very staunch, very conservative man, big fellow. And I had lunch with him the first day, and he's, oh, there's just nothing to this. There's nothing to this. Nothing, just nothing. The last day, on the Thursday, pardon me, he looked at one of the witnesses and said, 
we want those files opened up now, being pointed right at the person like that. And when a U.S. congressman does that, he, he, the sweat was on his brow. This man turned complete 180 on the whole issue after hearing 30 hours of testimony. Paul Hellyer was there, Stan was there, Bassett was there. I was there tucked away in a corner, covering it all. If you have not heard this man speak, you need to read his books. He's got two out that are just recent, A.D. and I forget the name of the other one, his most recent one. He's probably the most thorough researcher that you'll ever imagine. He's an incredible individual. I spent time with him on airplanes and in hotel restaurants uh, for the Disclosure Canada tour that happened just last April. We went from Montreal to Toronto, Calgary, and to Vancouver. And Richard gave a presentation at e each one of them. Astounding insights, astounding. And he has a really fine way of, of framing the whole issue in a way that's it's, it's soft-spoken, but he really gets to the meat of the issue. And if you haven't read his two books, the first two books, UFOs and the National Security State, you really need to um, have a look at those two books, volume one and two. And then, of course, this fellow here, okay, he's a relentless soul in all of this, if you heard his presentation. And, of course, this individual here, probably the best researcher in Canada that we've ever seen. And if you want, really want to find out about the UFO issue, go to Presidential UFO and you can spend easily a month reading this information and still not get to the bottom of, of uh, all the great stuff that Grant has on his website. So, um, any one of these individuals could. I mean, if, if things work out, you know, you know how spontaneous things are. I mean, how did we find out about the, 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 the Watergate plumbers? It was an accident, a total accident. And then it led to the most powerful man in the world, ostensibly, you know, resigning from the presidency. All because some plumbers screwed up and gave money in a plastic bag to somebody that they shouldn't have. That's the way it happened. This issue may land up in the same way. But the advantage that we have, the tons of information that we have, the files and the documents proving that the government's been lying to us for almost 70 years now, this is way over the top. So it's self-evident that something has to break. Okay? And some person, some journalist, maybe there's somebody sitting here, I'm not sure, that could just maybe crack that glass ceiling. Somehow. And eventually create what I call, or actually this is not my term, this is Stan, Stan Friedman's term, a cosmic Watergate. The realization, A, that we're not alone, and that we're being engaged by these individuals. Okay? Thank you. Yeah.